Uh, it was uh, probably the start of a decade long of stadium rock shows at the Cotton Bowl, as well as the Texas Jam. And the lineup was just awesome. And if you look at the lineup today, you'll see that they're still awesome. In those days, I was, um, I was into like this numerology stuff. And, and numerology is this thing, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous now, but numerology is this thing where you, you know, you, you use the letters and words and they add up to numbers and stuff, and there's good numbers and there's bad numbers. And David was always sort of enthralled with the fact that I was into this numerology stuff, because he was, he was into some esoteric stuff too. Uh, who represented some of his bands, ICM, and he called me, he goes, you're not going to believe this, I just saw a license plate and it had Texas on it with two X's. And he thought, oh, that's like a real omen. Texas. So he came to me and he said, what do you think of Texas with two X's? And I, I remember working out all the numbers for him and saying, David, that's going to be real good. The numbers are real good and stuff like that. It's the biggest musical event Texas has ever seen. The Texas World Music Festival, July 1st to the 3rd at the Cotton Bowl. With three days of music, the world's largest movie theater, a battle of the bands, flea market, fireworks, laser show, a rock and roll midway, the zoo is your official information station for the Texas World Music Festival. The night before the Texas Jam, we had a show with Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush. And the idea was that there would be, you know, five, six, ten thousand kids hanging around the night before, and that we wanted a place, safe place for them to go. So we created this concert at the Coliseum which was adjacent to the Cotton Bowl. And only 300 kids showed up. And I know when Frank Marino walked on the stage and saw basically no one there, he just threw his hands up in the air and walked off and didn't play. And so that was quite an interesting start to the weekend. The radar is absorbing, just sponging up this insanity, not to mention the flesh and the babes and the firmness and the cheerleader factor. So there was a tremendous wet t-shirt contest Please. after that. Over here. <laughs> so I wouldn't have changed that. That was good. Yeah, it was. It was beautiful. The sweat factor is always beautiful, man. It's like baptism by grease. I love the baptism by grease. You know, the hotter the better. Ted, what a character. Still to the, is to this day. Uh, he considers himself a survivalist. He's a, and he really is an expert shot. And he's a good bowman, and I respect the fact that he eats anything that he kills, even if it's a raccoon. But Ted Nugent is definitely one of a kind. I mean, that guy, he's such a redneck. Let's just talk about the baptism, shall we? That guy is like permanently on. I mean, he's just. They broke the mold when they made Ted Nugent. Ted's boisterous. Let's say that. He's outspoken and rambunctious. We're kind of Seattle girls, you know, and uh, we love animals, you know, and stuff like that. So it was kind of, oh, hi. I still had African dirt on my feet. I still had African blood in my fingernails. Politics, mouth and shooting stuff. Absolutely stream of conscious naked dancing around a campfire that Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley brought to me. He really, I'm, I'm telling you, there's nobody like him. There is no body like Ted. I mean, you know, Ted is an icon. You know, he's sort of came with his entourage of hot young thing. You know, he's really iconically a redneck rocker. And he still is. I want to play every city in Texas with electricity. Wherever I'm happy, whatever the size, I want to play. He is sober. He does not do drugs. He's like that, naturally. He's colorfully, you know, wire, wildly exuberant. That is not chemically induced. He's straight arrow. And Ted really is anti-drug, and he caught his brother, who was his road manager at the time, uh, John Nugent, he caught him snorting coke one night and he fired him on the spot. Fired his own brother, sent him home. He said, go to the airport, go home. So much for family love. So much for family love. He was the first one to play with the, you know, the sun completely down and have a light show. And I remember, <clears throat> one thing I really remember was when he took the mic and started beating it on his chest, you know, and thumping the entire cotton ball like doo doo doo. My heart stopped to beat for you, baby. Oh, 
Can you hear my heart beating out there, Texas? It's beating for some of that sweet Texas pussy. And he went right into Wang Dang Sweet King Tang. I was defying gravity that day. I mean, the sweat factor, I remember they squeegeed where I would, if I stood at a microphone and then I ran across stage, they'd have to come and mop out where I stopped anywhere because of the sweat factor. At the end of his show, he, he went so crazy and was going off so hard that he like literally passed out, you know. I mean, passing out on the stage. I mean, he was that exhausted from the heat. I worked a lot with, uh, with Nugent and Aerosmith. Being that we all had the same knowledge. I later, later on, probably developed closer friendships with Joe Perry and even Steve Tyler, and, and even Ted started saying nice things about me <laughs> after a while. Everybody but Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush loved it <laughs> because they were to, uh, they were on the show, and, and Frank Marino got there early. And I've never seen anybody sweat so much in my life. He came out there from Canada in leather all day and he didn't play till like later on in the afternoon and uh, I've never seen anybody, I mean that leather was like, I, I, I don't know how he got off of it. Let's see, I'm going to Dallas, Texas, oh by the way you're playing in the Cotton Bowl in the middle of the afternoon in the hot sun, I think I'll wear leather. A leather jacket, leather pants, leather, <laughs> <laughs> leather boots, <laughs> Neil Peart is a machine. But, but Frank is, yeah, he's, he, that wasn't his best judgment. He, he was pretty hot. In fact, I think that he almost passed out while he was playing, if I remember correctly. Frank Marino, Mahogany. Frank, Frank was a car guy, just like Jeff Beck, right? He was really into cars as much as he was into music. Yeah, well, I kind of felt bad for Frank Marino that night. I was a fan of his, too, but, you know, to come on after Hart, Ted Nugent, and Aerosmith, and so late. Truth is, by the time he finished that night, it was like 10, it was like 20 or 30 thousand people left, and uh, everybody else had had gone on home. And the people that were there were really the diehards that were there for the you know the duration of it all. You know, Frank Marino had the uh, he was kind of at the Jimi Hendrix slot. Jimi Hendrix closed the show at Woodstock, and. Uh, Played to uh, basically people cleaning up the trash on early Monday morning, and uh, I think Frank Marino suffered the same fate. But I don't know. I I, I just feel like he kind of got screwed just by having to go on so late and last that no one just it wasn't because of his performance. It was just you know half the people were dead by then. Two things made it increasingly difficult for the Texas Jams to continue. Those two things were none of the bands, uh, everybody wanted to headline. I think that many of the bands in those days just did things to excess. And everything got more and more and more excessive. And I think that the acts got less and less accessible. 